Cakey 808. It's Cakey time! Guess what? It's Cakey time! For you! Yay! We're here at the Oni Zuka Science Program. It's at the University of Hilo. And we're here to learn more about science. <laughs> so they can take off. And so when they took off, people, all the people raised the flags and cheered. And so pink fluffy unicorns dancing on rainbows. Onizuka and a map. Where to go? And this. And the last part. graduated from Konawaina High School in 1964 and from the University of Colorado with a degree in aerospace, aerospace engineering, receiving a commission in the United States Air Force through ROTC. He was an aerospace flight test engineer at McCle Mc McClellan Air Force Base and at the USAF Test Pilot School at Edward Air Force Base while logging more than 1,700 hours flying time, selected as an astronaut candidate in January 1978. He first flew as a mission specialist on the STS 51C, the first space shuttle Department of Defense mission, which launched from Kennedy Space Center on January 24, 1985. STS 51C Discovery completed 
48 orbits of Earth with Ellison logging a total of 78 four hours in space. Lieutenant Colano Onizuka was a mission specialist on STS-51L Challenger, which was uh, launched from Kennedy Space Center at 11.38 EST on January 28, 1986. The STS-51L crew died on January 28, 1986 when the Challenger exploded one minute and 13 seconds after its launch. here at the Onizuka Science Fair and we and we just came up from the strawberry DNA place where we attracted DNA from a strawberry. DNA makes makes up a living form and so everyone has DNA. Everything every living thing at least. <laughs> Plants, furry animals, even you do. And so um Today we track the DNA from the from the uh, from the fruit strawberries, and you see it floating around. It kind of looks like mucus. No offense. Yeah. And so, if you if you ever want to learn how to attract attract DNA from a fruit, uh, extract. extract. A, extract a DNA from a food, then you just um, just go to the Onizuka Science Fair. I through it's kind of gone right now. And we're here at the Onizuka Science Fair, and I just happened to run into one of my classmates, Michael. So, Michael, how do you like it here? Um, I'm enjoying it. It's really fun. There are tons of activities. Like one that I started off with, we got to make strawberry DNA, and it kind of looks like snot. But that's okay. It's just kind of cool to see like how it looks separated from the actual strawberry. I got it too. <laughs> okay, uh, what is that that you have in your hands? Um, it's a toy that can be mindless, and you could just play with it for hours, and it just never gets old. It gets addicting, and I want to buy one because I had one before, but I don't know where it is. That's cool. I got one too, but it uh, blinks. It lights up. I think. Um. But then it, my brother somehow bent it out of shape. <laughs> so, um, how was the food? It was good. I enjoyed it. I'm still eating right now, but I wanted to play with this while I'm eating. <laughs> so, what are you looking forward to later today? Um, cause at the opening part they said that there was going to be a magician here at the end so I'm kind of looking forward to that and see uh, what other activities there are that we're going to. Uh, I seen it, it was last year, it was actually a science magic show. Mm, that's going to be even cool. Yeah, and uh, if it's the same person he's pretty funny so. Okay, I'm um, looking forward to that. What workshop do you have uh, after lunch? I have no clue. I do not know the schedule, all I know is I'm going to something fun. Okay, thank you.
I'm here now with Claude Onizuka, and we're going to talk story. Hi, Claude. Hi, how are you? I'm good, thanks. I wanted to ask about this Onizuka Science Fair Day. is such a fantastic day for Keiki from all over the island. Can you tell me a little bit about how it got started? Uh, well, we uh, initially, this is an offshoot of what's been happening uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, we have a Onizuka Memorial Committee there that does a science day at El Camino College um, every year in April. So we thought, well, if they, they're doing it there, then we, we should try it here. And, and that's how it started uh, 13 years ago. So. And so what does this day involve? How does it work out? What, what goes on here today? Well, we uh, bring an astronaut out from with NASA and uh, um, to help educate the, the public, the students, uh, open the doors for them that, you know, opportunities are out there. Um, and a science day, we have breakout sessions uh, where the, the students can go in the different classes and learn science uh, projects and things. And it's just a, a fun day, educational fun day for the, the students. And um, we've had a, a good turnout every year and uh, we expect to do this again as long as we can. And I know I've come for several years and this is such a fantastic event. My kids have such a good time. I learn a lot by going with my kids into these. Um, and I know this is all, you know, we, we're honoring your brother as well, Elisa Nonezuka. Can you tell the population a little bit, something that people might not know? We all know he was a fantastic astronaut, a brilliant man. What do you know about him as your bigger brother? <laughs> Well, you know, Allison uh, grew up in uh, Kona, um, so-called out of the coffee fields of Kona, and you know, he he uh, studied hard. Uh, he was active in the community, and uh, he always uh, was very uh, inquisitive of anything that he came across: uh, toys, uh, machinery. He he tried to take it apart and put it back together, and, and but he was always interested in aircrafts. And that's how uh, he ended up in the Air Force. Uh, he got a full scholarship from the Air Force to the University of Colorado. And uh, he went into aerospace engineering and eventually, upon graduation, ended up in the Air Force and uh, at test pilot school at Edwards Air Force Base and applied with the astronaut program. And he was selected out of uh, some 8,500 candidates. They picked uh, a final 35 astronauts and he was one of the final 35. Wow, and what do you think he would think about this day happening every year at this time? Well, I think, you know, he, he'd be very pleased. Uh, his uh, thing about once becoming an astronaut, he always came back to Hawaii and uh, rather than uh, go golfing or, or diving, he, he wanted to go visit school children and, and uh, ex you know, share his experiences and knowledge and uh, just to help uh, inspire the young younger children. You're watching Peggy 808. We're here at the Big Island ROV booth and we're here to talk to Daryl about these magnificent underwater robots. That's cool. So how, how deep can they actually dive? Well, it's sort of limited to how long, how long this tether cable is as to how deep it can dive. So that's your limitation there. Well, if they did not need that cable, how deep could they dive if they didn't have any limitation? If they didn't have any limitation? I mean, if they didn't have any uh, cable to uh, stop this, them, this yeah. Well, most of them can go uh, miles deep in the, uh, the Marianas Trenches. That's what they do. Um, like Jason, you've heard of those little underwater ro oh, robots? <laughs> um, so there's actually no limitations. It can go miles deep in the ocean. What about so, are those actually, is that one actually full size? Or well, for our are they actually bigger? For a competition, uh, these are about full, more of a smaller size, or full size for our local competition. But professional ROVs can be the size of a, via, a car, a small car, weighing you know thousands of pounds. So, um, what do you mainly use them for? Research, is that what? They are used to do uh, repairs for boat sea vessel inspections. Uh, they are used for doing research, for measuring temperatures, for measuring water salinity. Uh, they actually are, were used in the uh, Gulf when they had that oil spill or that oil leak. 
uh, these ROVs were used as tools to shut off the valve and to do uh, repairs underwater. So the advantage is that you don't have to subject a person to dive deep underwater. You can have these vehicles do the work for them. So can they do um, most of the stuff humans can do? Like they can um, do all the repairs humans can do and all the research humans could do if humans could dive as deep as they could dive? That's, that's very true. And so uh, most of these robots are equipped with arms and measuring devices much like your hands would to articulate and to grab and to pick up and to turn things. Uh, and so that's why they're kind of ro like robotic extensions of our bodies with even cameras. So these little cameras are like our eyes. And if you put on an arm, it's an extension of your arm deep underwater. With them right now? They don't have what? I'm sorry? He was asking, um, if they, uh, he was asking if they had their arms with them right now. Oh, these are, no, these do not have um, uh, articulating arms or claws put down. But in the competition, students will design their vehicles with arms and claws to grab and to pick up things. Because in our, um, the, this is an example that they have to pick up these uh, these little things and to move them from one place to another uh, simulating a research type of uh, observation and with um, measurement equipment. So um, do you help build them or do you just work with them for research? Uh, well as mentors, mentors will advise and to suggest what students can do but it's really up to the students to use their creative abilities to find out how to problem solve real world uh, conditions. That's cool. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Wow, we're at the origami booth with all these wonderful origamis. Right now I'm trying to make the box. I'm just getting started. All right, and my brother Dallas is making origami. So Dal, what are you up to? I'm going to make a globe, an origami globe. That's cool. So, what are you going to do with it when you're done? Well, I'm probably going to put it in my bedroom for all my stuffies to see. Okay. Um, and so, do you like origami? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dallas. So the science fair is all about space, and we're here at this wonderful place that has a lot of fun facts about space. We're here with Peter Muschel. <laughs> and so what is going on over here? Well, we're part of the uh, Gemini Observatory, and we have two telescopes. One of them is up on Mauna Kea, and the other one is in Chile. And so we can see the whole sky that way, both, both hemispheres, north and south. Well, everything looks a little cool, but what's up with this 4.0 billion years ago on an asteroid? A yeah. large impact struck the moon. Yeah, yeah. The, the moon has a lot of interesting history behind it. And if you look at the moon, you can see it's all full of craters, yeah? And each of those craters is because something impacted it and caused a, and caused a, uh, caused a, a crater on the moon. And uh, so when we look at the moon, we see all kinds of them. They hit the earth too, but the weather wears them away and we don't see them. And the atmosphere burns up a lot of those rocks when they come in. But when they hit the moon, they stay there and we see them for billions of years. And I've heard that 
If you look up to the moon and you see all the dark spots, those are large craters. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, the, the the place is called the seas, which is where basically lava has come in and filled it all in a long, long time ago. But now the moon has cooled down so much that there's not much lava anymore, and so what we see are just craters that are left behind. But you know what? When the moon's in the sky, we can do certain types of observations with a telescope like Gemini. But when the moon's not in the sky, that's when it's really dark and we can see things really well up there in the sky. And we have some pictures here that people can see of some of the things that we look at with the Gemini telescopes and some of the things we study. Uh, you know, we discover planets out there um, around other stars and we can look at galaxies far, far away at the very edges. We look back as far as people have ever looked into space almost every night with a telescope like Gemini because it's one of the biggest telescopes in the world. So we can collect a lot of light. And Mauna Kea is the best place on the planet for looking uh, at, at the universe. And so we can do a lot from right here in Hawaii with our with a big telescope like Gemini. Well, I keep hearing the word Gemini telescope and I'm still wondering what it is. Oh, well, the Gem Gemini has two telescopes. One of them's in Hawaii, the other's in Chile. A telescope is just something that collects light, a lot of light. And we can collect all kinds of light from out in space and see things very, very far away. And the mirror, we use a big mirror to collect the light. And the mirror that we use for Gemini is eight meters across, so about 27 feet across. So let's see, what's, uh, let's see if we can see something here that's about as big as the Gemini mirror. Probably, oh, let's see. What do we have that's as big as the Gemini mirror here that we can show? Eight meters across, probably. Yeah, no, that's not even close. <laughs> well, the mirror would fit maybe, you know, right over here. See that corner right over there? It would fit where all those people are over there. It would fill that whole corner. That's how big the mirror is. Wow, that's one big one. But I know whenever I look up to, whenever I look up to Mama Kea, uh -huh. I see this, like, large thing on top, and I'm wondering, what is that? I think it's the Absorbatory Lab. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, that's what, we, what you see up there are the, the different observatories, and Gemini is one of them. In fact, from right here in Hilo, you can look up and you can see the Gemini telescope, where you can see the dome that, that protects it. We have what, what we call the enclosure, which is the dome and the telescopes inside of that, because we have to keep it protected from the wind and the rain and snow. This time of year, we get a lot of snow. And so that, what you see is the building that protects it. Well... What did I tell you? Do, they do have a lot of fun facts. Thank you for having me over here. Oh, well, thank you for chatting today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you come back. And uh, maybe someday you can work at a telescope like Gemini. What do you think? Well, space is really interesting. Good, good. Well, I'm glad you find it so much fun. Take some pictures, too. You can, you can uh, uh, take a look at the sky. Here, this one here is kind of nice. This is... Um, this one here shows what are called the Orion bullets. And those are clouds with iron gas in them that are speeding through space like bullets and they leave these trails behind when they do that. Wow, that's so beautiful. This has, it's spreading across the This has to do with the, the formation of stars. Uh, this is caused by stars that are forming down here outside of this, uh, off the edge of this picture. And when the stars are forming, they, they, they shoot off these clouds of gas that, that fly off into space. Well, we had so. very much fun. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs> bye. Okay, bye, bye. Bye, bye. Well, we had fun at the Only Secret Science Fair. Well, we did. We first came there, of course. We got our goodie bags. They gave a small speech. We got to meet an astronaut. And then we, we got attracted strawberry DNA. And then... We made solar cars. But first we had l a little bit of lunch and we bought this gooey thing. And we also bought some astronaut ice cream. And then we watched a magic show. And then it was done. Yeah.